Well, Jenny, it's good to speak to you about your board role. So you're a board member and a chair of the Audit and Risk Committee for Longhurst Group. Yeah. Um, so to kick off, do you want to just tell us a bit about Longhurst Group and what they do? Yep, so we are a housing association um, based across, um, probably best described as the Midlands. Um, so we've got more than 22,000 homes and we've also got a substantial care um, delivery section as well. So we run various care homes and provide in-home support as well. So it's been quite interesting a uh, couple of months uh, there for us and um, the team there have come together brilliantly during COVID. Everybody was all sort of pitching in um, and like you say my role there is um, chair of audit and risk um, and I also sit on our people remuneration and, and um, I can't remember what I said, we call it Premco. Um, so basically like people and remuneration and the kind of governance side of things. Um, so those are, the, those are the committees that I sit on cool. and I'm one of eight board members um, and okay. then we have two executive board members as well. Right and Jenny for those that are watching they're kind of curious about the role of the non-exec, why do Longhurst have non-execs on the board? So as a housing association the requirement is for the board to basically be made up of um, non-executive members so it's more of a nod I suppose to the sort of the charity type setup where trustees are, are generally not also employees. Um, in the housing sector non-executives are remunerated but not uh, not in all housing associations so it's possible to remunerate unlike in charities um, and in more recent years it's become more acceptable to have maybe one or two executive members on the board as well generally it tends to either be the um just the chief executive or say the chief executive and the finance director or, or, or whatever um, but it's it's all part of the fact that it's basically a regulated organization you know there are um lots and lots of public stakeholders in terms of what's going on and there's very much um a very strong focus on good governance and one of the ways you do that is by basically bringing people in from who are removed from the operational so we can see the wood from the trees that's the that's the key it's like we we can bring that kind of support and challenge that if we were having to deal with the detail every day we wouldn't be able to do yeah. um quite a few housing associations as well will co-opt board members as well so you might have um you might have people co-opted onto committees so my audit committee i have two co-opted members so they don't sit on the main board but they do sit on um, my committee um, so they just bring a sort of a wider perspective and it's a really good way of bringing in specialist skills okay get back so Jen can you tell me a bit about what your role involves there and what you actually do in that role <laughs> I probably they probably say I interfere um, <laughs> I interfere and I um, I don't know I try to take a a, a broad uh, perspective on on what we're doing so like I say my role is chair of audit and risk and I think um, I don't I don't think I'm kind of bigging up my role but I personally think chair of audit and risk is like it's probably like this the second most important role after the chair um, and I have a really good working relationship with our chair and you know he's fantastic at really um, defining that break between the audit and risk committee and the board in terms of that our ability to scrutinize and challenge yeah. um, and not kind of not 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 getting in our way but being really supportive so he's our, our chair is fantastic at that and so audit and risk um, you know as, as someone who was an auditor for 20 years it's like oh yeah I, I know what that is but for anybody else basically what we're kind of there to do is make sure that the sort of the risk is being appropriately responded to by the organization so we're the main people who speak to the external auditors the internal auditors we look at the sort of the risk mapping and although the board can't delegate that to us absolutely we kind of have the first pass 
on those things and if there is anything that's challenging particularly around regulation um that's where i really have to kind of step up and and take a clear role really so we're sort of i suppose we're slightly kind of the watchdog for the rest of the board and we but we like to remind the rest of the board of their responsibilities as well and then on the board um i think the thing that's really important and i always think of this when i talk to other people about being board members as well is i could absolutely say well my role on the board is i'm audit and risk chair and i have an audit background there are therefore i am interested in anything to do with like audit and regulation yeah. but actually i see that's maybe why i was recruited yeah but my role on the board is much broader than that so i don't kind of sit back and kind of think oh that's not my area of expertise i'm not going to ask a question and i think mo as most people would say i'm probably i'm not atypical because there are plenty of people peoply auditors out there but i think i'm probably a bit more people focused so i'm just as likely on our board to ask a question about how the culture is in the organization or for example pick up on something about equality and diversity as i am to kind of go well why haven't we got a control in that stops that happening and um you know i think that's something as board members we have to remember is that i have a hat that i can wear but i'm not a proper board member if i don't pay attention and partake in everything yeah i think that's a really good point jenny if you are a board member you have to speak into everything on that agenda and exactly. obviously don't, don't speak where you know nothing but actually sometimes it's yeah. the people from outside of a particular skill set that ask the really basic question that brings up a really good discussion so um yeah. you, you need to have that wider gaze to mm -hmm. look at everything that's going on in the organization you do and and i in my last um board member role where i was chair of audit as well um there were a number of things like big issue big ticket things um in the sector that i was in and i at the time was involved in like the high level conversations about where this was all going and what was happening and if i just sat in those meetings and everybody else had sat there thinking oh well jenny knows all of this there were so many things that wouldn't have got surfaced because i i understood stuff and so i didn't always ask questions about things mm. because i could work it through to its logical conclusion whereas other people would ask the question and then oh excellent the other 11 people on the board or whatever would suddenly understand as well um and that's yeah. that's where i've always stood back and i think um I particularly do that with my role as as chair of the committee is I don't see it's my responsibility to you know I I've, I was an auditor for 20 years so I know how to do an audit it's not my role to try and get the auditor to explain how they did the audit it's not my role to second guess them on what they're auditing it's my role to ask good questions so we understand what we need to know um and you know i think i've seen some over the years i've seen some particularly ex-auditors do that really badly where it's almost like a professional competition as to who can <laughs> you know, it's like it's almost like proving proving your place on the board by making somebody else feel really uncomfortable yeah. to kind of play oh i know more than you do or i'm really super good at this so let's make you and um i'm not into that so you know, that's that's ego's in the way yeah yeah and and i think some of it is um it's a misunderstanding as to what what your value that you bring to the board is yeah. so i remember on my very first role um so i was i think i was probably in my late 20s and i got co-opted onto a university audit committee and you know i was kind of probably like manager maybe yeah manager level um at work and and they were specifically looking for someone who had that specialist area and, and came from an audit background and you know i think probably if i'm completely honest i think probably the only reason i got the role was i think i was probably the only person in that region who was female of that level working in that specialist area quite, quite frankly i think i that's exactly why i got recruited and maybe for the just, first yeah that's not tokenism because they massively locked out <laughs> <laughs> well i don't think they i don't think they knew what they were getting but um so um and, and to be honest probably for the first two or three meetings they probably didn't get anything particularly good because i was like oh i've looked through the financial statements in great detail and you know i think there's some typos and i was like 
I, I didn't say anything about it, but that was like my prep for the meeting. I was like, oh, you know, reading loads of detail. What I then realized was actually um, the value that I could bring was I could be a bridge sometimes. So let's say the external auditors were explaining something really difficult and everyone's asking loads of questions. Sometimes I could just listen and kind of go, oh, actually, let me put it this How This is what we mean instead. Or, or sometimes I could kind of go, yeah, that really makes sense. And rightly or wrongly, people would be like, yeah obviously that makes that makes sense um but there were other things as well that i could do like once i built my confidence up probably most of the questions i asked had nothing to do with the fact that i was an auditor but i started off in that really tiny place yeah and that was where i kind of learned that um me showing off about what i knew and there was somebody on the on the committee at the time who who i was really um what's the word like not in awe of but kind of you know quite frightened by to start off with because they used to spout loads of regulations and they were like oh full of all this stuff and I was like oh my goodness they're so much better a board member than I am and then to, to learn, I realized after a while I was like they didn't listen to anything that was going on around them they basically kind of went here let me tell the committee everything I know about this topic it's like well that's irrelevant you're not the advisor to the you and it was that thing where i suddenly realized it's like actually it's my skills that have got me here but now i need to develop a different set of skills as a board member yeah i've kind of the my cv was the entrance into this role but in order to do this role really well i need a completely different set of skills mm. and you know i was really for fortunate let's say that i had the presence of mind to go for that role i had a boss who really backed me and went just go for it you know we want you know get on get yourself on that committee uh take whatever time you need to go to meetings all those sort of things those those were fantastic then when i finished on that role i applied for another one which was a full board member role got got great experience there and actually there's a lot of people who come up to retirement for example, and go, go, right, well, my, um, you know, the rest of my career, I'm going to earn some money by being a Ned. So I'm going to be a non-executive director and that's how I'm going to make money. And you kind of go, okay, so where did you learn to be a non-executive director? When did you, when did you actually build those skills? And it's almost like, well, because I've been a captain of industry for the last um, 30 years. And it's like, yeah, but you're only good at it when you don't have control, when you're not actually going to be there every day. Are you any good at that bit of it? Um, and you know that's you know what I know. One of the things, um, uh, one of the things that's really important to me is people kind of going into non-exec roles during their careers. Because if that doesn't happen, if we don't do that, then all that happens is we end up with a load of um, board members who are kind of at the tail end of their careers and therefore really not in touch with what's actually happening. They become kind of less and less relevant. And that's not to say that having some board members who are retired, because you know what, it's brilliant. You know, when you get somebody who kind of goes, well, I've seen this come round, you know, 15 times over during my career, this is nothing new. We've all seen it before, you know? Yeah. You need somebody with that. But you maybe only need one or two people with that background and then everybody else you kind of need more current. And one of the really good examples I would give of that is actually in relation to inclusive behavior unconscious bias inclusion all those sorts of things where so many people who are still in the course of their career that's actually something that they're developing they're understanding they're really kind of embracing that as part of their career people at the end of their career they're not going to kind of learn that by osmosis so much and so they're not necessarily in the same space space as everybody else or if you think about agile working working from home all these sorts of things we can see how those of us who are, have been used to going into office have had to really struggle mentally with working from home well if we think about it if we've got board members who aren't even working during the day they have none of that experience they have no, no idea what that might mean for the business so that's why we kind of need a full range and it's it's why you know kind of getting we advocate it generally, Jenny, as multi-generational boards. Exactly. That's not what we're pushing yeah. for. It's not getting yeah. young people on boards. It's actually having multi-generational exactly. boards. Exactly. It's not, it's not out with the retired crowd because actually oh. recognise they bring loads of value. It's just learning to work more collaboratively cross-generation. And from my perspective, I think there's a sort of 30 to 50 age group that are probably really underrepresented on boards, given the skill sets they have, 
the perspectives yeah. and the insights they have in different groups. Um, yeah. That's the big opportunity. I agree, because I think there've been some great initiatives. So people like Leon Ward have done really well getting sort of young trustees. Yeah. Were right at the beginning of their careers, getting involved particularly in charities and whatever else. I think like you say, it's that sort of 30 to 50 bracket where to be fair, let's face it, a lot of people are like, I'm just too busy. I'm too busy to take this on. But if we look at the way that the world of work is going, so more and more people that I talk to, um, I, you know, I think you're a great example of this. People who, um, Scarlett is as well, you know, I'm, I'm doing, it, where we're doing bits of things and it's not like, this is my, this is my career, I, this is my job, I go and do this thing from nine till seven, let's face it, we, like longer than that, but you know, like Monday to Friday, I go to this place, I work with those people, I do this job. And so maybe this is the great opportunity for those people in that 30 to 50 year old bracket. Whilst you're building that, you know, portfolio career used to refer just to board roles, didn't it? Yeah. Now I think portfolio career is like, do you know what? I'm going to do my bit of voluntary. I'm going to do my paid board roles. I'm going to have my kind of my, my meal ticket work. That's, you know, that's how I, that's how I structure it. So I think, I genuinely think that the shifts in work life, um, kind of integration are going to make it easier for 30 to 50 year olds to get involved particularly if there's left traveling for work and things like that as yeah, well definitely um, and jenny if you were going to say what's your message for people who um are considering doing a non-exec role alongside a full-time position um i would say be really realistic with how much time you actually have to give yeah um make sure that your employer endorses it and kind of get that really nailed on. Most employers now have um, uh, lots of programs where you can go and do different things. So I think putting it as development and showing the benefits that you'll get as well for them yeah. uh, I think is really important. Um, and um, I think the other thing is do actually think about location. So um when particularly if you've got to kind of shoehorn in board meetings and committee meetings and things like that that extra bit of travel can be the thing that makes all of the difference so i think particularly for your first ball role if you're full-time working i would recommend really thinking about um uh where it is in location to maybe your main place of work or your or your home and then the other thing that I would suggest as well is I have so many people um, talking to me about non-exec roles and they all seem to start by kind of going, oh, so I think I might go for this role on a, on a school board because I think that'll be a nice, easy way to start or this really small charity because that'll be a really nice, easy way to start. And my suggestion would be that, um, A, there's not always a lot of value that you can bring to those roles as sort of a totally external person. B, in small organisations, governance looks really, really different. So it's much more about, you know, rolling your sleeves up and getting involved in things and being kind of, you know, the connection between the organisation and, and the world. Whereas being in proper governance where you're kind of like a true non-exec director, it's much more about strategic thinking and all those sorts of things, which, you know, for, 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 for many schools, not all, like, you know, if you're on a school board, you're not going to be in that sort of strategic yeah. thinking place. So I would, I would always recommend looking for some stretch and where you can really bring value. Yeah. I wonder about something, something doesn't sit well with me when some people say I'm going to do that as a springboard to the next thing, because this is governance, whatever yeah. organization you're in, that's the governance of that organization that you're impacting. That is a huge responsibility. You should take that seriously. You shouldn't be doing it as a springboard to something else. You should be doing it because you care about that organization's governance. And it concerns me if people see use roles as, a, as springboards, they need to be passionate about that organization and want to contribute there and also think that they're useful there. You know, you have to believe you're useful as well as thinking, uh, as well as going through an interview process and someone else concluding that you're useful. Um, exactly. I think the other thing that a lot of people overlook, um, particularly with with smaller charities. Now, this isn't to say don't go for a charity role. Um, I would highly endorse, you know, as well as the roles that we've talked about. I'm on a charity board. There's only three of us, you know, it's, but it's a completely different world. Yeah, governance. And I absolutely, my charity role 
is because I believe passionately in the work that that charity is doing. Um, and, and, and again, I really feel that I've got something to add there. So I, yeah. I can it really deliberately, but I also know from having had other governance roles that the skills that come into play on that organization are completely different from what I use elsewhere. And it's almost like I, it's not that they're, it's not that they're like apples and pears, but they're at different places on the spectrum. Yeah. Um, and you know, if you talk to, so I, I, as well as being on a board, I do a lot of work in governance and, you know, there are different levels of maturity. And my suggestion would be quite frankly, for your first board role, you want to find an organization that's got a degree of maturity so you can learn. There's good processes. It's not going to be down to you thinking on your feet. You're not going to be dealing with, you know, firefighting. You kind of want to go in and learn yeah. and bring something in a more stable environment to start off with. And that's how you then learn to cope with more chaos. That's a really good point, Jenny, because my, I often think of my, I think of my first board role as my position on the board of a specialist bank. When actually yeah. I was on a charity board before that, but my mind naturally goes the bank one was the first one. And that's because yeah. when I was on that bank's board, I learned good governance. <laughs> you know, regulated banks in the UK, they have to have good governance. And, and the people around the board were really, really talented. And the chair was really wise. And it meant that I learned that good rigorous process of how you govern well um, yeah. within that structure. And that is really useful. Um, so I see what you mean. If you spent time on, um, I imagine some really early stage startup boards, um, charity boards, you know, uh, uh, not smaller charity boards, actually, I'm sure larger yeah. charities do oh, yeah. have to get their government sorted. Yeah, but they do. They if you do. put it in that environment, you probably may struggle when you suddenly go to a more uh, regulated entity and see what their governance is like. You may, you may not be used to that. I mean, well, I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the, where I'm on the board as a charity trustee, there's three board members and at the moment, two and a half employees, including the wow. chief exec. So, so I can put my entire arms around that organization. You know, it's like basically like our bank account is our balance sheet, you know, it's, yeah. it's, and there's big decisions to make and there's important stuff happening. And that's not to, I mean, it's, it's a great charity. It's doing important things. And it's not to say that it's all plain sailing. But if I think about the, like one of the hardest skills, um, and I think it's where a lot of their, you know, and going back to like the captains of industry who kind of go, right, yeah. I've done my, I've done my, uh, you know, I've done my career, now I'm going to be a board member. Um, one of the things that people find hardest is that shift from operational to strategic. Um, and, and it's, Obviously, an executive is strategic as well. So it's not to say that the executive are like they're doing the jobs, but but they still have the ability to kind of go and prod at things and they get a lot more information and they are embedded in the organization all day, every day. And the hardest thing as a board member, um, and it's the thing that I see m most people, it's the thing I see people struggle with the most, sorry, that's a better way of putting it, struggle with the most, is being able to understand what's going on and get comfortable and confident that everything is okay with limited exposure and limited information. Yeah. You know, you maybe have three hour board meeting eight times a year, eight times a year is quite often for a board meeting. Um, if you're a committee member, you'll maybe have another couple of hours, four times a year. Yeah. Um, and then you've got like an away, you might have, you might have an away day, you might have the odd strategy day, you might have a bit of training. That's it. And you've got board packs and maybe some boards, depending on how much the information is, you know, you might be using a good piece of technology. So you see the management accounts once a month, but, but, but fundamentally that's it. Yeah. It's influence, not control. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it's not, well, it is influence, not control. That's right. And also it's um, checking and sense checking without all the information so there's that huge thing isn't there where um there's that huge word of assurance yes so it's like how do i get assurance that everything's okay and then for a lot of people that turns into reassurance and either reassurance is complacency because we just ask the executive and they go yeah it's fine and go oh, okay well i trust them so it's fine or reassurance is, well, what I'll do is I'll just on the sly ask for loads and loads of operational information. And that's yeah. the thing that I see sort of particularly sort of newer 
board members do is just ask for more and more and more information and all they're trying to do is reassure themselves um yeah i think sometimes um from my experience working with startups there's something about startup methodology of listening and asking questions to establish truth behind something to work out if there's product market fit and i think when it comes to board work there's a practice in that that's really helpful of working out okay this is a really there's something going on here i obviously can't ask every question to try and understand all of it but yeah. what i've got to work out what to do is to ask a question that will give me an insight as to everything that's happening behind there without interrogating all of it yeah. so it's working out what those insightful questions are that generally give you an anecdote into that wider picture but if that's yeah. sufficient then you gain comfort that actually i think you've got that in hand um, yeah. and that little sort of that little anecdote that you shared in response to that question that's given me peace that this is covered exactly and and i think the thing that's important there is in order to for that to work there has to be psychological safety and um, for the board members and also for the like whoever it is from the organization sitting on the other side of the table so um it has to be that that you can ask that question with the intention of understanding and it is responded to understanding that intention so that people don't think they're trying to catch you out yeah um because obviously one of the sort of the dangerous things is where um because that 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 board meeting arena or whatever else doesn't have psychological safety what happens is that it becomes a them and us situation and and sometimes as a board member you feel like you're trying to crack through something but the more you push the more the executive kind of feel the need to manage the message and that's when you start to push people into places where they don't feel able to be um authentic or sort of demonstrate integrity or it's where board members don't feel able to ask the question because they feel they're going to raise some sort of defensiveness and again i think that's where it's that sort of skill it's the skill of being able to work with other people really quickly to create an environment because you know like if you were an executive working together every day what would you do you go on a, like a away day after a away day you all have coaches and you all kind of you have a meeting every friday morning and you spend time in each other's company you go on socials you do all these things as a board you don't have the time or ability to do that and you don't have the time and ability to the executive like i say you your meeting may be maximum 20 times a year you you're and and i think it's that it's that sort of rapport building and um in insightfulness that people don't seem to always appreciate they need to have as a board member yeah you know they people kind of get of, of hooked on like say the technicality of whatever it is the board says they're looking for you know because everyone does a skills matrix don't they so they're like oh yeah i'm the the marketing person who sits or i'm the comms or i'm the digital strategy person who sits on this board and it's like do you know what that's fantastic because because when we need someone to ask a great question from that perspective that's fantastic but if you do nothing to build the rapport and build the right board culture the rest of the time then do you know what we can pay someone to come in and bring those skills yeah you know we we don't have to have you know i think this is where it gets really complicated and people try to build this sort of five dimension matrix don't they that ticks every box and you know i've got i've got someone who does this i've got my reflector i've got my decisive person and then i've also got someone who's from this community and that community i've got someone who's retired somebody who isn't and i've got an accountant and a lot do you know it, it's not possible uh, so the agility for board members i think is all in the style and the personality and being able to move in and out of different roles yeah um, that you know those are the skills people need to hone that i think get overlooked and they certainly don't get tested for in recruitment all the time so jenny you came into this from an audit background what would be your yep. message to people um who are audit practitioners who are thinking about doing non-exec work um that you aren't there to be the auditor of the organization i think one of the difficult things as an auditor is as part of your professional role you spend a lot of time sitting in committees you spend a lot of time sitting in boards um and you might be an absolutely fantastic um external advisor to those committees and boards fantastic that isn't what you're there for when you're on the boards 
um, your understanding of audit is really good and your ability, you know, is, is needed and your ability to interpret what's going on and ask good questions. Fantastic. But it's not a competition with the auditors mm -hmm. and actually you need other skill sets um, in order to be a successful member because otherwise you're just doubling up they've already got an internal auditor they've already got an external auditor they need something else from you so that would be my big tip for any external auditors looking yeah, at and they need to get used to recognizing that they've not been asked to join the board for one thing that they have to speak into everything else on their board agenda as well exactly and you know what a super privileged role you've already sat through loads of audit committees yeah. you know what good look yeah. looks like you know what terrible looks like yeah. Pick your role models and be those people. Um, and I can guarantee you those people will never have been the people who tried to redo the audit or score one off the auditor. They were never your favorite people. So why yeah. then try and emulate them? This isn't about, <laughs> it's your turn now to be an absolute beast with, you know, the, it's, it's not about that. And, and I have seen a lot of that. So that would be my big tip. Okay. And Jenny, um, what would be your message for women that are thinking about taking on a first non-exec role? Um, so I've seen um, a lot of women try to be something else on the board. And I think a lot of this stems back to what we call classic board behaviours. So quite rigid, um, you know, uh, quite withheld this 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 um perception of what gravitas looks like and this is advice for women but i would say actually it applies to anybody which is go and be yourself mm. um, and be authentic and you know why do we talk about women on boards being important well because on average because of our upbringing women tend to have prioritized different skills from men it's not entirely true all the time but it tends to be the case yeah. and therefore that's how you bring diversity it's that part of it it's not your kind of it's not your birth certificate that is creating the diversity it's it's a slightly different way of looking at the world now that's not to say that you know you go and join the board and suddenly you're responsible for empathy and emoting <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> oh yeah you know this is my role as a woman on the board but what i would say is don't don't try and be something different if if you don't get recruited to a board as yourself you're going to have a really rubbish time yeah on that board you have to get appointed to be authentic. And, you know, if a board says they're looking for women, then understand what they mean by that. So actually say to people, you know, lots of boards have it now, don't they have that diversity phrase at the end? Yeah. So actually, if that's something that is important to you or they've made a big deal out of it, ask them why that is and what they think that difference will be and then see whether that difference is what you can bring. You know, if you've spent all your career because of the nature of your career actually you spent a lot of time working with men you've adopted really traditionally stereotype male ways of working that's not to say that you shouldn't go and try and get on a board but you can really hold up the challenge to well is, are you going to be bringing that um cog uh, cognitive diversity that is it, so it it's kind of like you need to decide how much it matters yeah um, and then just be yourself and get only get appointed to board roles where you're going to be yourself yeah one of the things we've been saying recently is go somewhere where you think your skills your experience your perspective will bring value that, exactly that's one of the key things is you have to really through your analysis through your observations of the board that they have right now you have to think that you will be able to bring value there and that's you know that i do believe that being a woman on a board of all men you do bring a different perspective and that is helpful but it's got to be in collaboration with the other skills and experiences that you have that you've got to believe that that holistic um perspective that you bring will bring value yeah and and if you find people advising you to you know i don't know start wearing scarves or brooches or blusher or you know whatever it is something that's kind of totally out of your like your way of yeah. being then either it's really rubbish advice or it's not the right organization to be going for yeah like, i've done that earlier on in my career jenny that my yeah. hair when it's done like this looks a bit mad and actually yeah. for the corporate environment it would be better if you tied it back and i thought but i actually think it makes me look a bit boring when i tie it back <laughs> yeah 
yeah I just yeah. I, I just I'm just a you know okay I might occasionally take it to extremes um in terms of kind of thinking I'm you know this is what I'm gonna this is what I'm gonna do but How's I that think... the extremes Jenny what does the extreme look like to you is it wearing something totally wacky have you done that before I, no, I wouldn't say totally wacky, but I, I, you know, I, well, I, so for example, I can only wear Doc Martens or trainers yes. because of a problem, we, we've talked about this before, yes. I've got, can I wear Doc Martens? <laughs> and at first I was a bit like, oh, you know, because occasionally I look a bit like, you know, it's one in school uniform. So, so I have to kind of change the rest of my outfit. So I, you won't see me wearing a suit because yeah. I can't wear a suit with my, with my Doc Martens because I look like I'm either on the way to, you know, school um, or um, I'm a policewoman, you know, and, and it just like, it's like it, neither one of them is who I am. So, um, so yeah, I think, but, but I think it is that thing that kind of goes, you still got to be um, comfortable, but like respectful of the environment yeah. that you're in. So you know, I've got my smarter Doc Martins and my less smart Doc Martins. <laughs> That's brilliant, Jenny. So Jenny, what would your message be for the chair of the board? If they're looking at improving the mix on their board, what would your message be for them? Um, that you've got to start by looking at yourself and the board that exists already. So um, there is so much work on, let's call it the supply side at the moment. I mean, it's small scale, but there are so many initiatives and projects to try and bring more people into board roles who are perhaps from backgrounds that wouldn't normally have considered it or wouldn't normally get shortlisted. So there's loads of work on, on that side of things. But unless the board does the right preparation and does the right development itself, and that has to be led by the chair, then all that's going to happen is either you'll get a great shortlist and pick the person who is most like yourself still, um, or you'll bring board members on and they will they will fail because what you're asking of them is not helpful. So um, in terms of in terms of trying to create diverse, dynamic and inclusive boards, um, too much of the focus is on trying to get people so their CVs look right so that they can get on the shortlist so that they can then pass the interview. But the point is, then those individuals are expected to assimilate. And, and I think that um, a great question that board, should ask, uh, board chairs should ask themselves, particularly at appraisal time, is when I'm thinking about board behaviour and what good board behaviour looks like, how much of that is just because it's what I expect it to look like and how much of that is how I need it to look in order to be a great dynamic board? Yeah. Um, and stepping back. So before you provide any challenge to anybody on their behaviours, step back and think, am I putting this in the best way possible? Am I actually asking people to stop being themselves mm -hmm. or, um, or to make it easier for other people? And um, or is it actually just that their board, their behaviour is not appropriate for a board and really challenging yourself on what those differences are? That's a really good point. One of the phrases I use is prone to respectfully agitate the status quo. <laughs> because, because there's something about respectfully doing that. You need to acknowledge the culture that you've joined and that there will be a culture, there will be a board culture before you. Yeah. And if you're going to agitate things, it needs to be done with respect and in good relationship. It, it does. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is that the board needs to be ready to be agitated yeah that's I, I think that's what it comes down to and and at the moment um at the moment you know i think we're it's great that the world not all of the world but the parts of the world that we operate in have acknowledged there's a gap mm -hmm. um my view at the moment is that there is too much expectation of those who are not currently prime board members being expected to close the gap as opposed to the boards closing any of the gap. That's a really good point, Jenny. Yeah, we've, it's interesting your point of like, first look at yourselves, look at your board mix. And the articles that we've written the last couple of weeks, that's been our focus. Like the first step is evaluation internally. And yep. um, because otherwise, what the heck are you gonna write on your advert? <laughs> you know, you need to know what you're looking for and that will involve you doing that appraisal. But, um, and I think be brave, like brave leadership is able to say, 
where you are lacking as well. Um, and there's, that's so confident of, of boards of chairs to come out and say that. Actually, we recognise we haven't got as good a perspective as we'd like to have. You know, when you look at section 172 and you think about how you're representing the, the voices of those stakeholders, who the heck around this board is going to be able to do any of that? You know, that, that's, it's so great if chairs can acknowledge that they need to add to their mix. And I see that whether it's a listed company or a housing association, if you can put that forward well in an advert, to me, that shows such strength um, on the board than if you just say nothing and stay silent. Exactly. I mean, if you look at the women, and again, this is a huge stereotype, but if you look at some of the sort of first women who were on boards, um, so let's say maybe it started in about the 80s. I know it was a little bit before yeah. that as well, but let's say the kind of prime period when that started for women was the 80s. If you think about business dress in the 80s, women's business dress was, you know, like massive shoulder pads. <laughs> you know, people called it war paint. So makeup was war paint, massive shoulder pads, massive heels. And it was about walking this really perverse line between being super attractive to men you know trying to kind of be really really um out there in terms of color and whatever else um and also aggressive and masculine and pushier than the pushiest male yeah. person on the board and 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 you know what those women who did that all hail to them that they were working with what they had yeah. and they hadn't done that just like if the pankers hadn't done their bit you know we wouldn't be having these sorts yeah. of conversations now so it's not to criticize but that is not where we are now yeah you know, that 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 is about assimilation yeah that is about crossing the divide yourself by out bloking the blokes you know it's it's all of this all of that sort of challenge this now is about saying well there is something important in those differences and it's the differences that we want it's not that we want to tick a box we want the difference, we want the diversity because it will make us dynamic. That's a brilliant place to end. <laughs> thank you, Jenny. Um, thank you very much. And you know, your lesson, your lesson on video and lighting didn't factor in the fact that it gets dark. No. <laughs> so I didn't know. factor that in. So I've now got this one it little didn't. white light. It it didn't. But I'll just point out to you, I have my light on. Oh. You know, but you may be, because you're a bit further north than me, you maybe have a bit you're more light for longer if i got that right uh possibly it's just really gray here it's hard to tell because so much up here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway jenny brilliant to speak to you thank you so much no worries um, i really appreciate your insights and i hope that's encouraging for people that are thinking about doing ned work alongside a full-time job people from audit backgrounds women and that challenge to chairs to look at yourselves first is a great one so thank you jenny you've given us lots of takeaways no worries. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.